When you look at some of the things that we've actually seen with the collections in general, how hard has it been to sell when you were virtual? I know you were one of the first you know, ones to try and keep it safe, but actually go back in person so that you had that shopping experience, that you had the buyers coming in from all over the world to see a catwalk. Actually, actually we learned a lot in this uh, pandemic year, 2020 was, uh, was a tough year, but you know, through difficult experiences, you can learn. And uh, we learned a lot. And uh, one of the things that we learned is that we can control what, what we can control, and there are things with which we have to learn how to live with. And uh, you know, pandemic is one of them. Yeah. Um, and this, in the other, on, the, on the other side, we tried and managed to take risk, uh, to be you know, courageous enough and uh, flexible enough to be able to come out uh, very strongly from this pandemic. So Dior managed pretty well and pretty proud of my team. So, uh, Pietro, how, what did you learn about Dior actually in the time? Do well, people you know, buy first sales? Of, first, of all, first of all, uh, we learned how to deal with the local customers, uh, with the absence of tourism. We concentrated our efforts on local clientele and we discovered kind of a new world as we had more time to dedicate to local customers. Uh, we had incredible strive and incredible result with local customers. So I think this is something is a richness, is an asset that we'll bring with us into the future when tourism will be back. But this is what, understanding their taste or understanding actually what they want. Well, cocooning them, taking care of them, you know, uh, calling them up and setting up appointments and mm -hmm. what we call OTO, one-to-one -one appointments. And that's, uh, you know, that's clientele in the pure sense of the word. And I think uh, luxury today is about clientele, it's about relationship, it's about experiences, mm -hmm. uh, and it's about, as I said, one-to-one. -one. So I think, uh, that's, that's what changed and we had more time to dedicate to this customer, less tourism, less traffic into the stores and more time to dedicate to local customers. I think that's an asset that we'll bring with us in the future even when tourism will be back because sooner or later we'll be back. Are, are you expected to be back? I said December 2021, how does it compare in terms of sales, in terms of actually, again, your relationship with a lot of customers to what it was like in 2019? Are sales good? Yeah, sales are good. I cannot, you know, I know that you are in Bloomberg, I know that this is your job to ask, you know, <laughs> uh, but you are a listed company, so I cannot disclose, uh, but, uh, you know, September, last, uh, last September, uh, LMH disclosed the result and spoke about exceptional result for Dior. Uh, you know, trends are, are on the long term, so hopefully you are going to do a good Christmas as well. So where do you see the most demand coming from? If you look at your regions, and you're really everywhere, is it the US consumer, is it Chinese consumer, is it Europe Actually, what we like very much is the fact that uh, uh, Christian Dior has, uh, has uh, a lot of uh, uh, balance in everything we do. So we have uh, men and women and jewelry growing very uh, similarly, uh, and we are very balanced also in terms of clientele. As I said, you know, we managed to compensate the lack of tourism uh, with uh, beautiful, great performances with local clients. Mm -hmm. So I think that this balance uh, is again an asset that we uh, will bring with us into the future and is uh, linked also to the tragedy of 2020 in terms of you know, human tragedy. But you know, business-wise, uh, I think that uh, we came, came out and we are coming out uh, from this uh, pandemic much stronger than we were before. I mean, you almost have this natural hedge. Will, will men's wear at some point surpass, you think, the profitability in women's wear across the industry? No, I don't think industry? so, no, no. I think, no. Uh, you know, women is, uh, is the core business of Dior, is, uh, you know, the Maison uh, founded in 1947. Yeah. Uh, as a strong feminine touch. Uh, so, no, I never think uh, that this is going to be possible. How do you expect, the, you know, the travel points and the tourism to actually change the industry, you know, if, if not forever, at least for the next five years? Uh, you mean tourism coming back or, or the lack or of not, tourism? Or not, or actually the lack of well, tourism. Honestly, we, are, we, are, we keep investing in our brick and mortar stores, so we, we strongly believe in traffic coming back uh, to Europe at one point in particular, and flow of tourism restarting. You know, I am optimistic by nature, and I think uh, that uh, if it's not uh, at the end of next year, it's going to be uh, at the end of the, uh, 2023, but you know, tourism will be back, and we are preparing ourselves to welcome tourism uh, back into our stores. Yeah. Um, definitely, as I said before, we, we had a lot of learning and we learned how to uh, cocoon, treat and, and, uh, and increase our clientele and skills. Uh, and that, you know, is something that we will bring with us. But uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not concerned that tourism won't be back, you know. I, I am uh, maybe, you know, that's my personal opinion. Uh, but I think that uh, tourism finally will be back. Um, it, Pietro, psychologically, you know, we were worried that people would not actually spend when things reopened, and it was very clear from the get-go. As soon as shops reopened, people had all of this money that they saved and said, I want to buy myself something nice. It, it, is is it more evident in China or in Asia than elsewhere in the world? No, I cannot say that. I cannot say that. In fact, uh, uh, you know, my impression is that uh, people want to uh, pleasure themselves. Uh, they, they had a tough period behind them, and we still are living you know, we are in England here, we're talking about uh, 
Omicron variant, etc. So um, I think uh, you know there is still this mood of wanting. Uh, you know, a moment for, for, for yourself, a moment of pleasure, and I think uh, luxury is uh, nothing else about, uh, but about emotions. And uh, finally, you buy something because it gives emotion, it makes you happy for that moment. And I think uh, uh, we don't sell things that people need to live, uh, but we sell things that uh, people need to live better, probably, or just uh, enjoy a be better life. So I guess that means also to foray into this parallel world called, you know, the metaverse, the artificial, you know, the, the artificial intelligence, all of this, you know, even NFTs. How do you see that developing for the fashion world? Well, I think it's a very interesting development. That, uh, and uh, digital helped us a lot in this uh, period of, uh, uh, of lockdown and closures. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, clients learn how to purchase online, but learn also how to prepare the purchase online and then go into the physical stores. When we talk about uh, omni-channel and omni-canality, I think, uh, you know, what we lived and what we are living, uh, it's all about that. It's all about uh, a really flawless passage between uh, what's digital and what's brick and mortar. And I think that people, also people that were not used to that, maybe probably uh, people, uh, you know, of our generation, Francine, uh, uh, they learn how to prepare their, their purchases online, how to yeah. use online, and then how to fix appointment and then go to the brick and mortar store. So I think uh, this, uh, this flow between what's real and what's digital, the metaverse, etc., are more and more part of our world and will be even stronger in the future. Um, Pietro, are, is luxury and luxury items actually, are they price sensitive? We've heard from a number of companies that they've been able to increase their prices quite significantly with no dent to demand. Well, I think uh, it's all about inflation. You know, I saw your titles and inflation. We are waiting for today for the data in the U.S. But you know, it's uh, it's uh, everything costs more. We know raw material costs more, uh, transport costs more. So if you know, it's it's a must for us to increase prices in order to maintain profitability and to cover ourselves from this inflation, which is you know hitting uh, every industry, uh, not only the luxury industry. Uh, but again, the demand is uh, very strong and, uh, and uh, we are trying to catch up with a strong demand, uh, is the case for uh, many uh, branches into the luxury industry. Uh, and uh, so far, we, as you said, we managed to have uh, no impact yeah. uh, on our profitability. Um, Peter, one of the other things that we try and figure out is exactly some of the regulatory or crackdown in China on luxury and celebrities, what that means for luxury companies. H have you seen an impact? How do you see well, that listen, developing? I think uh, that uh, this uh, uh, richness redistribution policies uh, will have an impact to favor the middle class. The middle class is, uh, uh, is huge and growing in China. I don't know how many million people access to uh, you know, uh, middle class uh, revenues every year, and that's uh, you know our treasure for the future. So, in fact, I think this uh, middle mid, mid term or long term, these policies will have a positive impact on luxury. And uh, for the time being, we keep investing in China. We keep opening uh, new cities. We opened mm -hmm. last year Kunming, and uh, uh, we are uh, you know opening second stores in, uh, in city like Dalian, in city like Wuhan, uh, sadly famous. So. Uh, we believe in the future of China and we keep investing over there. I mean, well, at some point, again, the, the, between the U.S. and China, will the U.S. consumer become, I mean, they're very powerful at the moment, it's the biggest luxury sector in the world, but will they, you know, diminish as Asian economies power up ahead? Well, I don't think so. You know, what, what we saw in the U.S. is that uh, uh, it's a very strong market for luxury and uh, in particular this year the market is growing. Fantastic. So I, it's a nice race and it's a nice race to watch, you know what I mean? So yeah. we, we, we are very well positioned uh, uh, in the east part of the world as well and the west part of the world. And uh, I think, uh, you know, luxury being uh, uh, a world coverage for us, yeah. uh, we, we, we see these uh, two zones growing very fast and very profitably. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a nice period to watch. Uh, Pietro, you have two very fantastic designers, you know, in charge of menswear and women's wear. Is there a general trend that we dress down? So it's working from home, it's people actually, you actually, know, don't Francine, always wear a double, a double breasted suit. Look, look at us, Francine. <laughs> I think, uh, I think the, the trend that we are seeing in the last months is to dress up again. Okay. So we have... Uh, uh, strong demand for evening gowns, uh, beautiful, elegant shoes, uh, you know, and um, I think it's uh, in the last seven, eight months, uh, we saw uh, an envy to go okay. back and dress up and, and, so look, and look demand. great. And look great, yeah. So, it, you know, as uh, everything in life, there are cycles, yeah. uh, you know, after the cycle of uh, dressing down and, you know, being at home and... Uh, the envy not to be too much uh, seen outside right. has given the place to now uh, back again in, into parties, into showing off. 
Yeah, so you wouldn't do a Christmas jumper day. It's very UK. I need to explain <laughs> to you exactly what that is. Uh, Pietro, g give me a sense actually of what you think the legacy of the pandemic will be for luxury and fashion. Well, as I said before, you know, this, uh, this uh, ability to pass from digital to brick and mortar, uh, you know, for, for sure there are clients which access to digital uh, e-commerce. Yeah. Uh, Many new clients, uh, you know, in the in the in the in the case of Dior, um, and uh, the same clients are now understanding that it's as beautiful to to buy online as to go to visit uh, uh, brick and mortar. I think uh, uh, the pandemic leaves us also with local clients. Local clients are very important for us, and they become more important uh, uh, after the pandemic. And last but not least, I think, uh, as far as uh, my team is concerned. Uh, I saw uh, a great strive for entrepreneurship, of motivation, right. risk-taking okay. in my teams. Uh, and I believe that's, uh, that's, that, that are qualities yeah. uh, that uh, reinforced us. And that's, you know, the three points that I would say will bring us to the future. Uh, Pietro, I know you've also been doing a number of collaborations. I think the Sakai with the, the Japanese make was the latest in point. I mean, how are these in, important to actually be on the map to get talked about and get influencers well, you know, I, to buy I, it's, in? It's up to the sensibility of uh, Marie Gracie Cure and Kim Jones. Uh, you know, sometimes they collaborate, uh, sometimes they don't, but they get always inspired by what they see. Uh, of course, collaboration are, are giving, uh, uh, you know, a kick. Uh, and uh, they are important, but uh, for example, yesterday night we assisted to a show uh, which is Dior by Dior, and it was fantastic. So I think uh, it depends from the inspiration. It is not a policy for me yeah. going to them and asking them to collaborate with anybody. It should be spontaneous because right. I think uh, nowadays authenticity and transparency is, is, is key to succeed. Um, and therefore, you know, they have to feel free to create yeah. whatever they feel right for the moment. What's your biggest challenge in the next 12 months, given what we've all uh, discussed? You, you asked me. A very a difficult, very easy a, a, a one million <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah. The challenge is to continue to grow profitably with Dior as we did yeah. in the last uh, in the last four years, uh, and you know we always have to have respect uh, for the future, not uh, uh, have any fear, yeah. but respect. So you know, being prudent and uh, knowing that every year the championship starts from every team starts from zero. You know, and yeah. even if you have been successful in the past, that's not the recipe for being mm -hmm. successful in the future. And finally we will be judged for what we will do and not for what we have done. So that's what I repeat to myself every morning. Uh, so challenges are there and, uh, you know, we learn how to be flexible, how to change our strategy with this pandemic. It's another learning for the pandemic. We keep being flexible and try to uh, face uh, the future. And the future, you know, we cannot control.